Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Here we are. Chloe, good afternoon to you. Good morning to me. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I am good. Thank you for coming on. I'm honored that this is your first podcast you've done. I feel like you're so present on social media. I figured you had been all over the world on podcasts, but I hope people can hear you for the first time. Yes, it's an honor. Uh, it's a premiere. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Chloe show, the Chloe premiere. <laughs> when you do, uh, have you done obviously a lot of like uh, clinics and in-person stuff like that though, right? You're quite quite known to do that. Yeah, yeah. I really love the in-person stuff, but also with the corona, I think mm. that then uh, all the digital uh, yeah. education events happened. So yeah, exactly. What's that transition for you been like going more, you know, social media online, sharing all your amazing content? Has that been fun for you? Yeah, I remember like very first time I was like uh, having a lot of resistance to it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm all over it the, yeah. the whole time. So yeah, it was a great opportunity to get more worldwide. Uh, mm. and yeah, I want to help as many coaches as possible. So it's a good platform to do it. I know. Yeah. We feel the same way. And I think that your, you know, artistry and dance and stuff is the perfect medium. You know what I mean? Like something like Instagram or YouTube or like, you know, Facebook videos is such a great way to show probably what is so easy and fluent for you, which is teaching artistry and kind of like teaching choreography and stuff. I feel like out of all the things in gymnastics, that is one of the hardest things that you really have to see and watch somebody do. It's not like, you know, you can talk your way through drills. Um, do you feel that way too? Is it easier for you to kind of do things live or record those? Or is it, do, can you feel you can talk your way through people? Um, well, I do understand. So what I actually always try to create is that uh, everything I do with the artistic side to be uh, as clear as just the drills, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are very clear information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to make it as clear and methodical as possible so that everybody, everybody can become better at it, even if you don't have a lot of experience. Yeah, I think, you know, not that this is the form of question list we had, but I feel like that's also something that's challenging for artistry and dance, right? There's so, it's an infinite amount of things you could do for artistry and dance, whereas drills typically have four or five methodologies or ways people teach a round off or a back answering. I feel like your world is like a blank canvas. So I'm sure people really appreciate it, particularly for someone like myself, who does not do the choreography and dance that, you know, I outsource to my friends who do that. But I feel like a structured system is probably really helpful for coaches out there. Yeah, definitely. So it's... uh and I think, um, so I had a very classical ballet education. Mm -hmm. So I think that fundament is very clear mm -hmm. uh, and that's very helpful too. And I think that's also the base of uh, dancing and uh, gymnastics technically. So that's the very technical part. But then, of course, everything that you build becomes more and more like, um, yeah, abstract. Yeah, sure. W before we dive into the questions, what do you find coaches struggle with the most? You know, what do they come to you with? Is it, is it like the actual choreography? Is it, you know, the music? Is it, you know, help, helping kids learn how to be, you know, expressive? Like, what do you find they, they need the most help with? I think um, most of the time it's all about just um, to make it easier for them to start. So I think they're like uh, lost in the feeling of, okay, where do I begin? What do I do actually yeah. to help this? So I think to make this uh, steps, maybe. Yeah, to make the, the resistance like as low as possible and ah, to make okay. it as small as possible. Yeah, uh, just getting started. That, yeah, that really helps to make Got it small. It, yeah, and then maybe once they get that first step, you know, it's like a runaway train where they feel more expressive and they feel like they have more ideas to to work with. Yeah, exactly. And in the live uh, coaching sessions that I do, uh, I also really make sure that they do assignments themselves so that mm. they get to do it because if they do it they will feel it more and they mm. will get better understanding even if they don't know how to do it correctly then at least you get started and then you yeah. get confidence in like, okay i can create something i can create ah. a program right yeah. right and then from there you feel like you have more confidence behind what you can do your own self you know yeah and then you can just go on exploring you start with one program you feel like oh this is nice and then you go on and on and maybe you have one in between i have those myself too i was like oh, okay this one mm, <laughs> yeah well <laughs> let's get this one and we'll <laughs> we'll try a new one oh man something i'm always super impressed with is my best friend eva who did all the choreography for our girls she would do 12 
13, 14, 15 routines per season. I have no idea how she, she remembers them all. She remembers every single one. And like when somebody would have a problem with their like routine, she's like, oh, well, it goes like this, this, and this. Like six months after she choreographed it. Are you like that too? Do you have like a special memory where you just like remember these things? Is it from your training? You can like segment it. How do you remember 15 <laughs> routines per year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Well, for me, I think it's a lot to do with uh, musical memory. So I think mm. I have like a very special button of musical memory. I remember all the children's uh, intro songs uh, of <laughs> my programs. And so the musical memory really helps because it's connected to yeah. uh, Dance. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I have that with lyrics. So maybe I can resonate a little bit with you. We're like songs when I was like 12 years old or 11 years old. Like as soon as it comes on, I can remember it. So I guess, I guess that does make more sense now. Um, so I will uh, openly admit that clearly this is not my area of expertise, but people on the team and many other friends of mine, you know, obviously you're coming on helping with the symposium. They were really interested to hear your thoughts and your methodology. So I apologize in advance if I fumble over some dumb questions, <laughs> hopefully as, a, as not the resident choreographer at our, at our facility or when I was, um, I can do that. But I think the first place to start is in your eyes, you know, how, what, what to you is like a gorgeous routine? Like what makes up for you a really incredible routine versus, you know, maybe some, um, more average routines in your mind? Yeah, well, um, I think the ones, uh, the level where it becomes a difference between like a good routine or a gorgeous routine is that uh, as somebody in the audience that you can feel something. So you get moved mm. by it. Mm. And to be able to get moved by it, there should be like a level of, uh, of course, elegance and ease to it. But then also uh, the combination with the music that it's like, perfectly in line with the music because music makes you feel a lot of things right I think everybody can relate that music can make right. you feel and it's the same with dance and then this combination of course uh, can make it magical and I think that lies between the difference in um, being able to present yourself but then another level would be to express yourself from a place uh, from within so if the mm. gymnast is able to show something from within that we cannot really put words to, yeah. uh, but she's able to express that, uh, then you will feel something and then it becomes magical. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love that lead off. And I also think too, you know, a lot of people, obviously when you watch someone who's a phenomenal tumbler, it looks like, like it's like so impressive and it looks so easy and they're just so good at it. And something about the contrast between someone who's a phenomenal dancer and does have that emotive kind of like expressive, but then also has tumbling that's extremely clean and crisp and artistic. I think that's always something that's really captivated myself and others when you watch amazing floor routines, right? As someone who has that balance of dance jumps artistry but also has phenomenal tumbling and do you feel the same way that that contrast is, is something as well or do you feel like the tumbling has to meet the artistry if that makes sense um well i think uh the artistry is to be found in everything gymnastics right so mm. yeah if you watch like a very nice tumble pass and it floats in the air you see it go up up and the line alignment is great and the landing yeah. is soft yeah that's very magical too and then the difference between this kind of artistry that's throughout every apparatus actually, mm. uh, and the expression that you can put into dance. And of course, the more the facial expression and being able to tell a story, I think yeah. it's hard to tell a story in the air. Yeah. And with a double layout, it's hard yeah. to <laughs> 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 express something else. But then this combination is uh, definitely really magical. I think that you get like the uh, embodiment of artistic gymnastics, right? Mm, right. And then also, I think from your eye, probably having a classical training in ballets, you probably you can see when someone is very technically uh, polished, right? And is technically profound, like in the same way that somebody watching tumbling or uneven bars or a phenomenal release, when somebody really is a master of technique, it looks so crisp. That's the only word that comes to mind for me from a gymnastics point of view is like the tumbling looks easy and looks so fluid. You can easily see someone who's got phenomenal technique and how that's so much differentiated from someone who's got like average technique, right? Do you see that with choreography and dance too, when someone's really classically trained and they have really good mastery that they feel a different kind of expressive that way? Yes, definitely. So you have the technical, of course, you have the physical preparation to be able yep. to do these techniques, of course. Right. So it's like the layers. Uh, and if that fundament is super, super steady and, and clear, and then, of course, you can see in the dance that she's able to express herself in a, in a better way. So yeah. she has more 
capacities and abilities to, mm. to tell this story that she's trying to, to sell you. Mm. Um, um, yeah, it builds upon this, this technique. Yeah, definitely. So the technique is a way, it's like the tools mm. to be able to, uh, yeah, show yourself and express right. yourself. And the more that is there, the more you get captivated by it, I think. Because if if the technique is not there, mm. then you see something is off and maybe you don't see what it is, but you you, you get out of the feeling. So yeah. the captivating part becomes a bit less. Sure. And is it, and is it true in your world too that if those foundational technical things or that physical preparation is maybe not quite there, that as you try to ascend higher and higher levels of difficulty or jumps and leaps or more artistry, that it seems to be challenging. You can't really continue to progress because those base layers are not there. Because that's very true for uh, the tumbling pieces too, which is like the foundational pieces of flexibility and of strength and stuff is it eventually it catches up to you if you don't have those base layers. Do you find that's true as well? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You have like a, a you, you reach the ceiling um, yeah. earlier on, right? So yeah. you have this uh, technical part, which is mostly ballet, but then you, of course, also have a lot of different dancing styles, like sure. many, many. Um, I think the one closest would be kind of modern, contemporary, which is also mm -hmm. pretty elegant mm -hmm. and in line. Um, but all those vocabulary pieces if they're not put in there right um then yeah then there's less possibilities of course so sure. when i oh, for example when i try to let them improvise and they haven't had any like schooling right then of course like a little girl that's three years old if i ask her to improvise she can very yeah. well because she's yeah. like completely free still and yeah. uh have has uh no limits but yeah. she's not schooled so she cannot do certain movements of course right and so i guess when you when you're working with someone for the first time or someone asks you to help them like how do you approach that from the beginning like what factors do you look at do you watch their old routines do you just want to see what they've you know their, their natural style is like how do you start that i think that's to your point in the beginning is that's really overwhelming and stressful to a coach is like okay i don't know where to even begin with this whole process so what do you do to start with someone um, well, uh, it depends, of course, when I already work with the gymnast or not. So if sure. I do, do not work with this gymnast and I get to meet her, then of course it's nice to get some information, but actually it doesn't really matter too much. Yep. Um, the amount of information, because when I get, see her, then I will also receive the information. So I will see the potential. I will see mm. what's her what are her physical features? What are her superpowers? That's mm. what I'm actually looking for and the potential that she has. And then uh, also in combination with what kind of person she seems to be. So what kind of personality is in yeah. there? And then that combination, uh, we will use that to work together. And then I think most of the magic can happen in creating a safe space and mm. making sure that there's trust and uh, you've built some connection so that this gymnast is uh, kind of free to explore too and then we can become creative yeah and then it go, can go anywhere <laughs> yeah and that's great what, what percentage would you say or maybe like what chunk of it is like their personality their style their natural like their high energy their lower energy they're more you know uh, more of a serious kind of tone gymnast versus more of like an open and fun like how much of it is their personality versus like your expertise of you've seen other gymnasts that have been successful and you've seen routine choreographies that have been successful like what's the balance there between how much is the gymnast and then how much is maybe the coach's expertise um, well, of course, if somebody has, uh, if, if a gymnast has a good um, technical education, yep. then of course she receives all these uh, dance vocabularies, these tools, techniques. Sure. Uh, so if they receive that from me throughout mm. several years, which I did, then probably you can see my kind sure. of movements through sure. them. Um, but then, um, I always try to use as, as much as their own personality and their own ideas too, so yeah. that they become the owner of their floor routine. Mm -hmm. Um, so I try to put as much in there as what they are, but, um, it does depend of course, if the gymnast is able to do that. So actually yeah. two days ago I was working with a gymnast and she, uh, so we just started and she, um, is pretty artistically uh gifted <laughs> so she's pretty talented in this so i give her a lot of space to give input um so that 
it becomes like a collaboration mm -hmm. but maybe some somebody else who doesn't feel so safe or secure in dancing then i will take yeah. the lead more and yeah. put more of my things in yeah, I think that's probably a really good thing to talk about because we we're going to talk about this later in the episode, but it's coming up now is I think for a lot of it's easy to make routines or what I've observed from Eva making routines when someone's naturally a dancer, they're more outgoing, you know, they have maybe a technical background they did before gymnastics or alongside it. It's very easy. You have like a blank canvas where someone's really there. However, in our situation, there were many girls who felt really uncomfortable dancing and, you know, they, you know, for, for many reasons, but one is that you're literally everyone's staring at you, right? And when you're 11, 12 years old, that's a very overwhelming situation to be in. So how do you help athletes who maybe aren't natural dancers or are really shy and are overwhelmed by that everyone watching versus, you know, that extroverted person who loves to dance already, which is a little bit easier to choreograph for. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I actually like the challenging ones because oh. I feel like this process is interesting. So the process of growth. So mm. I think with the ones who uh, have feel like more insecure about it, I would try to work more on personal development Mm. too so i want to focus on that i want to focus on uh, the process and then mm -hmm. trying to get them to enjoy this process so not too much focusing on the outcome but focusing or the presentation but focusing just on enjoying the movements and mm. exploring movements um but then there's also like uh, little tricks to do of course so for example if there's a gymnast who's very shy or introverted by nature yeah, I, I try not to force anything. Of course, I want to stimulate some things, but I believe forcing will uh, get the different outcome like than what right. you want right. to achieve. So uh, in this case, I would try to make movements and just give her placements. So her head should look at her hand above and then her head looks down and then she looks at her knee and her shoulder and then left hand, right? And then she gets like this, technical cues actually and then it doesn't feel so much like performing but when you look at it it looks a lot better because her head is moving so it feels like she's dancing a lot mm. and enjoying this dance mm. on the first part there i think it's really interesting which is that you're trying to maybe help them enjoy the process for themselves right it sounds like you know you're trying to in the same way in gymnastics we're oftentimes trying to have somebody do the work and do all the hard stuff because they love the sport they love tumbling they love skills not for the judges not for other people it sounds like maybe a way of that too is to help them encourage like you know well do you and what do you enjoy about this process for your own self don't think about the judges or your teammates or whoever's on TikTok or stuff like that right and i also think i caught there was trying to shift their focus on themselves internally right in the routine like watch your hand watch your knee watch your shoulder not stare at 14 people watching you on the side of the floor is that is that my right there am i wrong yeah definitely yeah so both uh, both of these so i really like to uh, explore i want them to uh explore movements and how mm. the movements feel from an internal place because that's safe right and then um they get to enjoy it from a different point of view because the performance part is just one part of it. And of course, it's a very big part in terms of when it's competition time, then it's performance time, right? Yeah. So it's there. But it, but a lot of the time we spend, of course, in training. So if in training, they can enjoy this exploring part. And then I think another thing that's very nice uh, to do is to create a team performance because, mm. yeah, it can be very scary uh to do like a performance all by yourself right but then when you can do it in a team so just for fun but still at very educational use of course then you get a process with a team and then they can carry each other and then ca they can do it together and when you mm. do it together you get more space to dare to do it and to help each other lift each other up uh and learn how to perform in a more safe environment before you sure. do it by yourself Sure. Yeah, that's great. And I wonder too, um, I've noticed with Eva when she picks music and styles is that I think, uh, and maybe in gymnastics, this is, I'm so naive on this because I'm a guy who never did choreography routines myself, but I feel as though there's like almost like a, a stereotypical approach to dance, which is like you said, modern and very elegant and very flowy and very kind of like classically ballet. But I feel like as the last 10 years has gone on, you see a huge variety in styles and, you know, 
you have someone like Ellie Black, for example, right, who can be much more of a strong, powerful based, you know, um, routine, whereas somebody else who's very like, you know, classically trained in ballet and really picks up that naturally. And I feel like seeing high level elite gymnasts or college gymnasts who are doing much wider arrays of choreography has allowed younger generations to like, oh, I don't have to do just a ballet, you know, classical kind of uh, Eastern European style. Is that am I wrong? That or is that true? Yeah, I believe that this variety is great. And I actually yeah. want it want it to expand even more mm. because um everybody is different so it's really nice if if you feel like there's a variety of possibilities uh and then you can uh easier find one that resonates more with you right so right. Uh, uh and i think the hardest thing for this uh, for my perspective is that of course we have the e score right and now the artistry artistry score right but uh, it's all about um, like extension and point, point your feet and straighten your arm. But there is something that's, of course, limiting in that because when you want to tell a story, you don't want to bother about your left toe <laughs> being straight. It doesn't add to, <laughs> to the story. <laughs> Uh, that's funny um on that too i'm thinking now aloud is is so when you're working with someone you're trying to fit their personality you're trying to understand where they're coming from do they bring you music do you say pick five routines that you like or you've seen you know on the world stage or you've seen in college and bring those to me and let me kind of like see what you like or is it you have ideas from watching them and then you bring them music to say like do you like any of these because like, i know eva used to go through the opposite which was Look on, you know, look on college, look on elite, look at worlds, tell me what styles you like of dance, of music, you know, what performer. And sometimes that's just like someone, you know, an athlete looks up to their whole life and they want to do a similar thing. Or other times, like I said, it's, it's a very different contrasting style than the classic stuff. And they like that contrast. So do you bring music to them or do you, like you say scour YouTube and bring music to you? That's a good question. So music is a really big part, of course, of the routine. Mm. Um, I... Um, my ideal world then i would pick it for them so i okay. would i would uh but i want to give them choice i believe that to be very important so then i would try to find but it takes a lot of time yeah, exactly. <laughs> but i would try to search for to choreograph for that's a lot of music yeah it's like the most most of the time is is searching the music actually and then after that that becomes the fun part right mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so I try to find music that I think suits her uh, or I think uh, could bring something out of her. Mm. And I try to find like at least two, but not too many choices too, because then. Yeah. Um, so and then uh, she can still pick, but uh, because I do believe it really helps me, of course, also. Uh, I try not to get my own flavor in there, but of course it does help if the music does something to me. Right. Uh, because if I feel the music, uh, and I, of course I can learn to feel the music too, mm -hmm. but if I feel the music, then uh, yeah, that I can become more creative, of course. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. It becomes that joint yeah. process you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I really want them to be part of the process. But uh, then... It also depends. So sometimes I, I will also choose to let them search. It depends if it's a gymnast that I work with a lot or not. So, yeah. Yeah. And then back to the uh, kind of closing the loop on helping Shire gymnasts. Do you find that introducing either group choreography or teaching in lessons in large groups allows them to not feel as awkward like when they first start to develop a style or get comfortable with that i would imagine you know that doing things in a group setting of 12 gymnasts all working on some sort of thing together allows everyone to kind of be clunky and awkward and laugh at each other and giggle and stuff and then that maybe allows them to feel comfortable and then maybe you go to a group of four or a group of two right? i know they do this in um like more classical kind of dance settings is they'll start with a large group and then okay five people go at the same time and then if you feel as though you can go solo go solo do you do that as well where you kind of go smaller and smaller groups mm, well that's an interesting concept actually it's nice yeah <laughs> that's it's a good one definitely um, um i haven't done that before so what i what we did is when we made group choreographies uh then we did give them also again uh quite a lot of personal input so for example mm -hmm. you would give uh you can give every gymnast uh like the assignment okay go pick uh, like eight seconds from your own floor routine and you can just add different parts together whatever you want or uh, uh, like one eight count or maybe two eight counts mm. and then um, they can put that in a dance so the dance actually becomes 
something from themselves and then the translation to the, their own Florentine, of course, also becomes uh, better mm. and they can learn each other uh, something. So, and if they teach each, each other, then you also get an interesting team process. You get a new dimension of how does this movement work? What is the process? What is the feeling? How can I explain this movement to someone mm. else? It gives me a new understanding. So, yeah. Yeah, and I feel as though what a great way to build a culture and a team environment and really positive, upbeat vibes is to kind of, you know, joint collaboratively create dances and things like that. I feel like that'd be a great team building exercise for a lot of people. Yes, definitely. And it helps for like, for example, of course, I also created like team choreographies myself. Mm -hmm. But if you have a hard time to do that, if you feel like, oh, I don't know how to do it. I think even you could do that. You could yeah. give them this assignment, right? So you can create a team performance, even though you don't have any artistic background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shifting to more like yourself and the coach's side too. Is, is So where do you get your inspiration from? Do you watch just, I'm sure you watch a crazy amount of routines, right? But also like, is it like your own past experience? Is it like your, obviously there's so many choreographers that are wonderful around the world who are choreographing for athletes we see on the world and, and stages stuff. Do you watch them? It's like, oh, I like that. I'd like to learn more about that. Is it traditional dance styles that you then bring to gymnastics? How do you get all your inspiration for so many routines you choreograph for? Yeah, well, um, I try to do it in as many ways as possible. I feel that's the best. So the most variety, uh, then I also... Uh, enjoy it most so I of course I definitely watch uh, I also get inspired by just gymnasts so I watch mm -hmm. them improvise and observe them uh, of course I watch a lot of routines uh, I think a lot of my um, technical background really helps of course because that's my own dance vocabulary that I build mm -hmm. um, and I learn a lot by feeling so for example if I start to do something so I start to dance or I put on a song then um, in this moment, when I start to do it, I will become creative because something is happening. I'm mm -hmm. moving and uh, by doing this, uh, I get a new information. And yep. then my favorite one uh, is um, actually since three years, um, I've been dancing a couple's dance with my boyfriend. That's awesome. um, which is great. So it's a kisomba uh, and it's very creative uh, uh, dance. But it's interesting because normally I lead and I make up everything. And now I have to listen to him. Mm. So I get a, a vision of his creativity and his mu musicality because it's all improvisation. So it's all very free uh, and very expressive in that way. So that's a whole new dimension for me that I get a lot of uh, inspiration from. Like a um, few weeks ago, I was at Nick's Roddick's Easter camp. And the first yeah. evening, I had a free evening. So I searched on Google and I found a dance school. So I went to uh, took some classes. and then uh, Did Nick come with Leonie? <laughs> uh, I should have asked them. <laughs> Nick is like one of my best friends. So I'm easy to poke fun. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick, that's the next one. When, we, when I come over to London, Nick's going to go to a dance class and I can't wait. I'm actually, I grew up in a very musical family, so I'm, I have no problems with dance at all. Whereas I don't know if Nick follows suit. So that'd be, <laughs> we can bring Dan Lonsdale too. It'll be a whole trio, you know? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It would be very fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, something you said that stuck out is that term dance vocabulary. I really like that. Is that like, is that from classical, like your training and stuff? Or is that something you came up with? Um, I haven't learned that anywhere, I think. Yeah, it's just my own term of, so yeah, kind of like learning the alphabet, right? Yeah. You get a lot of tools also in, in gymnastics, you have all these profile skills and segments of skills that are very important, mm. uh, important. Uh, mm. and in dance, I think it's the same. So it's dance vocabulary in the sense of techniques in ballet, but also of course, in the sense of different dancing styles with their own embodiment and feeling and uh, vibes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually really enjoy, you know, I know a lot of gyms that I work with or, you know, colleges I work with who do, you know, from a very young age will have, you know, once per week, they'll do 30 minutes or 60 minutes of dance for classically trained dance. And I don't know, I view it as one, I view it as just like gymnastics is if you can learn all the basics very well of shaping and handstands and how to run and how to like, you know, do yourself well, you have an unlimited uh, canvas for, you know, skills down the road because you have all these basics really well done. And I find as though it's similar with dance that I can imagine is that if you learn a lot of styles when you're younger and 
you do a lot of different, like, you know, just basic, you know, vocabulary, basic letters that you have more to play with when you're older. And I also really like this too, because it's a great way to train, but not, you know, to have so much stress on their body when they're young. Like that's one of the hardest things that I see as a medical provider and as a coach is, you know, so many kids want to do so many hours, but they unfortunately can't handle all the impacts and the volume. But an hour of dance per week is a phenomenal way for flexibility and prehab and strength that can directly serve your goal down the road, but is obviously a little bit more probably fun and a little bit more, you know, low impact. And I know I, I just feel like it's important to say that because there's so much benefit at a young age of learning this, then you have unlimited, you know, to work with down the road. Yeah, definitely. I think like gymnastics, very demanding for the body, of yeah. course, and also for the mind and for everything else. <laughs> uh, and I, I feel like ballet is kind of the same. So it's all, it's also very demanding, very technical, mm. very precise. Uh, and there's a lot of tension in there and I feel like we miss the relaxation part so mm. they can get overly tense. I see a lot of gymnasts doing all these handstands, of course, uh, so they lock their head in because they have to look straight in the be at the beam also. So to get more relaxation in there, I feel like also will really help to give them more uh, rehab, right? Or like to, how do you say it? to yeah. recover yes, um, in an active way. It's like an active recovery time mm. because you can let loose a little bit, you can relax a bit more uh, and it's really fun and explore explorative. That is so interesting. I've, that's never dawned on me to right now is the contrast between like what you need in gymnastics, which is like a lot of like, you know, a lot of like, like tension and, and shaping and stiffness and like really rigidity, which you need to be successful. Um, and I guess there's, there's a little bit of philosophy, uh, you know, metaphor there for a gymnast who's high strung and type A personality all the time and is really like stressed out. Whereas maybe the contrast of dance or something like this is the opposite, right? Which is, you know, the ability to, like you said, let go and have a little bit more freedom and be a little bit more uh, fluid with things, I would say. I feel like that's an important skill for a young gymnast to learn. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes, of course. We first want to give them, teach them all these tension things because they don't understand how this works. They're all like very, uh, nobody's born with tension, I, I believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to teach them this. But then I feel like um, what they uh, can learn better is like to move with certain relaxation but not like complete relaxation because then it's again it's yeah. sloppy and yeah. uh, so it's a kind of controlled more uh yeah, controlled more chaos control. you know <laughs> that's what i would do <laughs> yeah, something like that <laughs> yeah yeah there's definitely a really deep metaphor in there for like you know a gymnast learning to be fluid in controlled chaos but we'll leave that on the shelf <laughs> to get some more questions. But, so yeah we're rolling on the idea of like you know the gymnast stuff like that but we're transitioning now to like helping coaches understand which i think is a lot of your expertise too as well as i know for sure you know there's i've i've worked with people i've heard from coaches that they themselves weren't natural dancers and they really struggle with it so now they're in a position where they have to choreograph for their athletes or learn you know the routine to do that so what are your tips for the coaches side who maybe aren't naturally talented you know and the, the thought of starting or creating a routine is paralyzing to them because they're like oh i'm not a good dancer so how in the world could i do it for an athlete what are your thoughts there yeah well i believe i think the most important thing is to get out of your comfort zone mm. <laughs> so um um the gymnast uh, has a lot of capacities right yeah. and abilities so it's not that you have to be a great dancer to be able to teach a gymnast and a great floor routine right um she has to be able to to do the great dance <laughs> uh, and you have to be able to dare to do it so if the gym because you're the example right so if the gymnast feels like uh, at least you have no shame and at least you're just trying and mm. it's funny actually even so you're trying and she's seeing you're struggling and you're saying yeah oh my god I can I cannot do it but I'm doing it anyway and then uh, something like this something like this and just laugh a bit about yourself do not take it too seriously mm. then you create a really safe uh, space Love even that. for the gymnast to be able to also do this mm. and to uh, yeah, to be more free and expressive, being able to dare to do that. Yeah, I love that, right? What a great uh, 
example, right, for for a young athlete to have as a coach who's knows they're not a great dancer and knows it's a little awkward. What do you think that that poor twelve year old athlete's going through? It's the same thing that you're going through, personified a little bit older. And I love the example that you know, um, you know, the the best thing a coach can give a gymnast is the, is an example to follow, a good example to follow. And I think that that comes out really true in the situation. And and I also think too that you know some of the best coaches I know were not great gymnasts themselves. And Nick has openly said this that he didn't do high level gymnastics in any way, shape, or form. But to your to your uh, you know point, he was willing to get uncomfortable and realize he had more to learn and, you know, try new things and travel places and get mentorship. And so, you know, anybody probably looking on the other side of coaching is like, you know, well, I wasn't a great dancer growing up and I didn't have the best choreography, but if you're willing to get uncomfortable and kind of learn from people and like, you know, it just play around and stuff like that, you can probably develop a pretty good skill set in the same way that I would consider Nick as one of the highest class coaches in the world, even though he was not one of the best gymnasts in the world. And I think the opposite is true where great gymnasts are sometimes the worst coaches too, but we'll stay on the best part of that. So, <laughs> Yeah, a coach who's willing to, you know, show, like you said, to show that they're willing to play around with it and be awkward and, you know, kind of be clunky with it, but they're learning and they're trying. I feel like that's a phenomenal thing for a young gymnast who's also in that position to, to see, you know? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's a it's a certain vulnerability that you're showing yeah. in that way, right? Uh, and that creates a really nice space because, yeah, we actually ask uh, these gymnasts, we ask a lot of these gymnasts, we, we tend to forget that, but we ask a lot of them. And then uh, we ask them to get out of the comfort zone. So I think we have to do that, too, uh, in order for them to be able to do it. Sure. And bringing it full circle, right? Which is that you were talking about how it's more important that the shy introverted gymnast learns to do it for themselves and they enjoy it because they're trying to learn and get better and not worrying about what people are saying or judgment or pe fear of people, you know, making fun of them. That's probably the same parallel you're explaining when you're trying to be not a great dancer, but learn is like, well, I'm doing this because I want to be a better coach and I want to help my athletes. And I'm sure people will, you know, poke fun at me or laugh at me or whatever or stuff is. But you're saying like, despite that, I'm going to do it anyways. Again, what a great example to show your young athlete that you're willing to do the same thing you're asking them to do, which is step on a floor, you know, into a new routine in front of a bunch of people and a judge and do it for yourself and not worry about the fear of their judgment or have healthy ways to deal with that anxiety a little bit, you know? Yeah, just the willingness to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And um, it would be like the same that if you guys uh, would join this dance class, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Nick, you, you heard it, buddy. You heard it here. <laughs> um, how do you feel... On the bigger picture, how do you feel the choreography landscape has changed over the last like decade or so? Because I, you know, only am vaguely familiar with the actual changes technically, but do you feel there's been a large change from 10, 15 years ago to where we are now and, you know, the current age? Um, I think when I go like even more back, I think there was also like more compulsory stuff and it was all very elegant. Mm -hmm. Um, it was more about artistry, but I do believe, I, I do agree with, with what you say about that. Uh, it was more like one-sided so now there's more variety so that's yeah. good development uh, then I think there was an area a, an era where uh, we overdid the D value so it became just too much about tumbling I believe yeah. there was a, a time where we could even do five tumbling passes which is just way too much because you <laughs> cannot do any dance anymore yeah. um, so I think uh, when that uh, in a past few years i think maybe past decade we're trying to build back into the mm -hmm. balance yep. um of uh, 50 50 kind of yeah. uh, yeah. more artistry uh so that it's well balanced i think that's also the night the most uh the biggest change we've seen yeah i think that's also so something i've heard from eva and i've also heard from other friends of mine is that the pendulum maybe swung too far in either way. There was a time when maybe it was like all one style of dance, like you were saying, and it was very like, you feel like you're watching the same routine when everyone's trying to, I don't know whether it's like the judging style promotes that as they want to see what they think is like classic, you know, beautiful gymnastics or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you see everyone doing what feels like the same modern kind of classic routine. But then, yeah, we went the other way, which is like people aren't dancing. They're just doing five tumbling passes or four tumbling passes. And that became a little stale too. You know, even as a male gymnast who we did all tumbling passes, like, I can understand someone's perspective of we don't want either, right? We don't want someone who's like all dance, very minimal tumbling. And it feels like you're watching the same routine in different ways, shapes and forms. But then on the other side, you don't want to see only tumbling because there's no time to really express yourself and have a differentiator that you feel that way. Do you feel part of that is coaching? Is that the judging style has changed to allow more options for that? Is that, I don't know, is that just like we've seen gymnasts who step out of the box and do something they really love and it doesn't matter what it looks like? How do you feel that's changed? Well, I think... Um... 
it's really nice that we try to like improve this change with the artistry sheet. Uh, mm. So I think that really helps, helps, but then still there's this place where we try to make something that is not that objective, trying to make it ob objective, right. which is, I think, really hard. Um, and the downside to creating a lot of like um, cues mm -hmm. is also to, that we uh, that I want to be aware of not losing the freedom again because yeah. I, I yeah I believe that like in a uh, in the past it was always like this gymnastics dance so it's very gymnastics specific kind of dancing which yeah. ca can be like a specific genre if you ask me yeah. um, and nowadays it becomes more and more expressive in uh, originality people are getting more and more out of the box mm. uh, which is great and i think we could go even further with yeah. that yeah yeah how, how um in tune are you with like the college gymnastics situation here in the states do you watch college gymnastics because that's like a completely different style of dance and creation and choreography i feel like the elite world is very far away and not all the way obviously but just watching college gymnastics you know when you see 50 routines per per year per month that are world and elite level it's a very different style than gymnastics in college i feel like has a completely blank canvas like you can do whatever you want with music cuts and stuff do you watch it all or no yeah, um, yeah, I yeah, I don't watch it all, yeah. <laughs> but of course, uh, I'm familiar. Um, yes, I I really like this freedom of expression, and I like that there's now an artistry deduction sheet, which should actually be artistry bonus points, if you'd ask me. Ah, I like that. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, anyway, um, yeah. So the positive thing is that there's more focus again on artistry. You can mm -hmm. see that it's now not the one who's doing like big tumble passes and just a few arm waves. Uh, <laughs> you're not getting away with that. That would be me. That would be me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're not getting away with this uh, lack of energy, lack of energetic, uh, full body, full uh, engaging mm. Um, mm. Uh, choreography anymore. But there's just more rules. I feel like because rules are very narrowing right mm. something that's creative the more rules you put into it the the less possibilities you have yeah. so for example um i created a routine uh, a few months ago and there was like this kind of like hop and it was not at all a cat jump like it doesn't look like a cat jump at all but then for some reason a judge decided okay this is a cat jump but then poorly executed so mm. then you feel like okay what can you then still do right. with all these rules so right. i think yeah rules is the um the uh, enemy of creativity <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, i was thinking that and you actually probably led the next question which is you know to finish up here before we chat about your lecture is you know if you had a magic wand and you could change whatever you wanted in the in the world of gymnastics for artistry and dance what would you like to see because there are a lot of judges who do listen to this podcast so you might be able to get one of your, your thoughts through <laughs> Ooh, oh wow i do like having a magic wand <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah i think just um i would love for it to be more free when it's in the dancing part so mm. of course when we're doing like a leap or a turn it's very clear there are certain rules um but i do think that it would be great that um there's more freedom in true and honest expression with the body and yeah. not caring too much about it being straight lines and straight knees all the time sure. which of course isn't true but i feel like it's still too much because that's that's why you get this gymnastics kind of dancing right yeah. so if we can get more freedom in expression that would be great and if we can turn it into bonus points for artistry it would be awesome too <laughs> yeah that's amazing and i can imagine there that one of the ways to maybe do that is to I know nothing about what what percentage of judges do have a technical background in dance and understanding or who who knows right but maybe there is some uh opportunity there for you or other choreographers to uh explain to them how to look for a trained eye what's a cat leap versus what's not versus you know those kind of things if maybe judges had a better technical eye and if coaches had a better technical eye like okay well this is more of like the creative dance zone and this is what it can look like versus this is the tumbling kind of more classic rules maybe there's a way for to get a a, a better of both worlds there right which is like a, a better technically trained uh, coaching or judging eye, I would imagine is better at distinguishing between those lines of like what is creative dance, what is more gymnastics dance, what is skill work, no? Yeah. 
Well, even if you're saying that it, it like this, I'm thinking then AV, maybe you could even like differentiate uh, being like technical. So the technical artistry part right. and the creativity artistry part. Uh, if you can put those in two different boxes, maybe that will help. Because at this moment, I do feel that execution and artistry are is a bit mixed up also. Um, yeah. So I feel like execution should be the technical part. So the technical execution um which you can school of course if there's more education it will be better yeah um and then there's also the more creativity more freedom explorative kind of self-expression mm. part that will be another side yeah i love that well this has been fantastic and i'm really excited to share with people i think a lot of people are excited to uh see your lecture at the symposium i know a lot of i've gotten a lot of feedback from when we posted you were doing about thankfully you finally have like last year we didn't have any artistry we didn't have any dance and so i kind of caught some heat for that <laughs> which is why we sought you out so i think a lot of coaches are really excited to hear your philosophies and your building blocks and what you would say so can you share a little bit of what uh, will be coming uh, in the lecture in june Yes, of course. Um, so it will be, um, of course, about how to build a, a floor choreography. Uh, I think that's very nice to have like a very structural tools so that you get more uh, structural uh, process in there um, mm -hmm. and a lot of tools. Then um, we are going to try to dive a bit more into movement perspective. So ways to improve artistry. And I will give you like a look through my lenses of what to look mm. for. Uh, and how to look uh, at certain movements so that you can yeah. become a bit more creative with them and get more input and hopefully a lot of inspiration. Uh, and we will talk about uh, improvisation as a skill that you can learn and teach. That's great. That's great. So it sounds like it's a it's, it's your kind of systemized approach to how you build floor routines. But then within that, you know, there's tools to help on each thing, which is the construction, the improvisation, the, you know, the the, the dance aspects that are probably more challenging people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm looking, great. looking well, forward I, to it. I've been working uh, for a very long time on it. So. <laughs> yeah, I did have an inside peek and I saw it and it's going to be very, very good. So I don't want to spoil any of the goods, but yeah, people will love that. I'm very excited about to have that in there. So I thank you in advance for your hard work and your time on that. Well, uh, it was a pleasure. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap it up there because I think, again, you have a busy day and so do I. But I, I want to uh, just say thanks for, for coming on and chatting a little bit. Is there anything you want to share with people before we go or? Um, well, if you, if you want to get more inspiration, of course, you can always try to visit my website, uh, which is my name, yeah. Chloe van Babel .com, or mm -hmm. uh, go to my Instagram. Um, yeah. Definitely. And if you we'll want, to, ha want to get some help, yeah, you can always send me a message because I'm always happy to help. <laughs> Yeah, please do. Everybody take advantage. Of it. We'll put your, your website and your Instagram and everything in the show notes so people can reach out to you and find you if they have questions. Great. All right. well, awesome. Looking thank forward to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great day. I uh, hope you have a great day too.